plenty to howl about in the new movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. Some have balked at the language. Rolling Stone counted a record 506 F-bombs. And others take issue with the depiction of the 80s excess. But as WGBH arts editor Jared Bowen explains, in both film and on stage right now, it's a good time for bad guys. For decades, this was the defining cinematic take on American capitalism. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. But Martin Scorsese's new film, The Wolf of Wall Street, makes the old Wall Street look like Sesame Street. Stirring up bucket loads of controversy for its Caligula-like depictions of 80s decadence, Wolf is based on the true story of Jordan Belfort. Played by Leonardo DiCaprio, he's a penny stock trader turned Wall Street titan, skiing on mountains of cocaine and living in a penthouse. The home and the magazine. We don't work for you, man. Yeah, my money take your boobs. Technically, you do work for me. The controversy swirls around whether Scorsese glorifies Belfort's swindling, in which he ruined investor livelihoods to the tune of more than $100 million and landed himself in jail with a three-and-a-half-year sentence. Also this week, New Repertory Theatre opened Imagining Madoff, an intimate play which depicts imagined conversations between convicted Ponzi schemer Bernie Madoff and a fictional poet and Holocaust survivor. It's treacherous territory, giving words, complexity, and perspective to one of the greatest villains of modern times. It makes Wolf and Madoff one and the same in more ways than one. Both the film and the play may be ugly with repulsive characters at the center, but audiences love them. The Wolf of Wall Street is on track to become one of Martin Scorsese's highest grossing pictures ever, if not the highest. And even though Imagining Madoff only opened on Monday night, it's already sold out six performances and added two shows and more seats to the theater. So yes, greed is indeed good for business, Emily. Yeah, I saw Wolf of Wall Street. I've not seen the play, though. But do you think that this is a legitimate controversy, or is it one of those things that's ginned up to get every Everybody to go see the movies or the play to see if they agree with that. I'm not sure it was ginned up. I think the, obviously Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese have been out there defending it, but I think that people legitimately are upset at the glorification of greed here, which I completely disagree with because I think you go to see this film and you see, and you've seen it, you mm. see this decadence, and for three hours Ugh. you're assaulted with things that are just so Awful. grotesque. I mean, everything that's loud is louder, everything that's naked is nakeder. I mean, there's so, so much full frontal nudity oh, right. and drug use so shocking, and yeah. violence in everything so that by the time it's over you leave I found that I left the theater relieved because it was finally all over yeah. but it achieved what it was supposed to which is that this is one of the most despicable times in our period. I thought, I thought so too. So I did not see the play and not to I'm not going to spoil it but uh, the movie does not deal at all with victims. You're never, only on the phone, you never have any encounter with a victim and his, Belford's victims were largely p poor people. He really played on Madoff's victims were another category. Some of them thought they were the smartest kids in class. We were all losing our shirts while they were getting, you know, 22 percent return. Do they, do they deal with those people? Not necessarily. And, and I, the same thing, this, this play, Imagining Madoff, is also somewhat controversial because originally the playwright had imagined this conversation between Bernie Madoff and Ellie mm. Wiesel, who was one of the Madoff victims. He took umbrage with that. Mm. She took him out of the play and, and made it this fictional conversation. But this is different because it, it, in a very fictional way, it, it plods through Madoff's thinking and what his reasoning may have been and, and what his reasoning wasn't. And it's, it's so, in the, in the same way that uh, Wolf of Wall Street is very thought-provoking for all of the excess, imagining Madoff is very thought-provoking mm. for, for what he may have been thinking. All right. We're going to bring in another voice on this, Christopher Robichaud. He's a lecturer in ethics and public policy at the Harvard School of Government, where he teaches courses on political philosophy through the lens of pop culture. So you saw Wolf of Wall Street last night. Could this movie be part of a, your course curriculum? Uh, I don't know if the, if the movie would be, but certainly the, the topic is very relevant. I'm, uh, I'm going to be pitching a course soon on economic justice. Uh, more and more people are, are, are genuinely concerned about economic inequality mm -hmm. in this country. You have the president talking about that. You have the pope talking about that. And uh, I, I think we're, we're being the American public, the world public, we're, we're at the end of the line a little bit. We want, we want some answers. You know, this excess has, has had uh, debilitating effects on so many people's lives uh, for decades now. But a lot, most people... Uh, most people who are in the world of the 1% have le legitimately 
earn that money, whether we like the way they did it. They're not crooks. They're not out stealing money the way Madoff and uh, uh, Belfort did. So it's, it's, it's a different category. And it's one thing to say, well, these were crooks. These were people preying on people. But is it fair to say that, that the people who have legitimately earned their 1%, <laughs> You know, it's, isn't that a different category? It's certainly a different category in terms of, you know, you, you're, not, you're not a villain just because you, yeah. you've made a lot exactly. of money. But we're yeah. treating them like that. Uh, I don't know who we are. I, I'm, I'm certainly not going mm -hmm. to treat them like that. But I do think that the, the wealthiest members of our society have an obligation, a moral obligation, uh, to be open to, um, and I'm going to use words that people don't like, you know, some, some redistrib redistribution of, of, of their wealth uh, to some extent or others. Uh, it, it's giving back. Now, some people say that that works by, you know, trickle-down economics. I think a lot of us are very skeptical of that. Um, until the, the wealthiest do start contributing more to the common good, um, they're on the hook. Mm -hmm. and they so don't have to be villains to be right. on the hook. So, is, Jared, is some of the concern that this is going to kind of go down in history is the way it was when really it's just a fiction, like sort of like Oliver Stone's JFK, is that part of the concern? Uh, I, I think it may be, and it could legitimately be. But look, at the end of the day, this is art, and this is entertaining. I mean, this is one clip that we have <laughs> just from the beginning of the movie, which shows you that this is a comedy at the end of the day. Yeah. Nobody knows if the stock is going to go up, down, sideways, or in circles. You know what a guys is? No. Fugazi, it's a fake. Hey, Fugazi, Fugazi, it's a wazi, it's a woozy, it's a fairy dust. So this is comedy at the end of the day, and you have to remember, it, it is the, it, the artist's viewpoint. It's Martin Scorsese. Look, look at this period, and the same with the playwright and imagining Madoff. These are their visions, and I think sometimes for some of these pieces, we do conflate history, which is a shame. Hopefully people will do their own research at the end of the day. All right. Chris Robichaud, Jared Bowen, thanks.